And a very good morning to you. How are you doing this Sunday morning, the 18th of November 2018? It's a beautiful morning in Manchester, in South Manchester. Been up since just before 6 a.m. myself. It's glorious. It's a bit chilly, but it's still not a cloud in the sky. Very autumnal. Nice to be alive on a day like today. How are you, by the way? Are you well? Are you all right? Are you in good form? This is Sunday View. Going to take a look at the front pages of the Brexit-centric Sunday newspapers here in the UK. Going to do that in a couple of minutes' time. We'll try and add one or two bits of human interest stories in there as well, best as I can, but it is Brexit heavy today. I'll keep it as interesting as I can. It's your Sunday View. Tweet the programme right now. At Richie Allen Show. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The best way to reach me... The best way to reach me when I'm on air. Let's uh, do Sunday View. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv. Yeah, but a Sunday view. Where else would you be on a Sunday morning? Live on Fab Radio International, TriggerWarning.tv, RichieAllen.co.uk as well and other platforms. How are you? It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Not much to report this weekend. Re- relaxing, rest and recuperation is the order of the day. Maybe yours has been a bit more exciting than that. Maybe you've been quad biking in the Pennines or something like that. Let me know if you have anyway through Twitter and I'm sure you'll have things to say about what's happening with the Brexit process and again through Twitter let me know what those opinions are and I'll read them out as I go along. All right, all right. Yeah, good stuff. Going to jump straight in there. Oh, by the way, before I do, it seems that some of us, you know who you are, have had a sense of humour bypass. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I came across an interesting story yesterday, which I tweeted because I thought it was very interesting. And it was a story about a Brazilian pilot who was on his way to... He might have been on his way to Saudi Arabia. He might have been crossing Saudi Arabia and and heading even further east. I don't know where he was going. But anyway, at 18,000 feet, he converted to... Islam. Right. Now, that's that's his own business. And I have no truck. I lampoon all the religions equally. I have no interest in religion and organised religion. But I found it funny. You can't not have a sense of humour about that. And I posed the question, what would you think if you were on that plane, right, as a passenger, And you overheard somebody saying, oh, by the way, Jimmy is converting to Islam on the flight deck. And it seems some of you have had a sense of humour bypass because I had some emails overnight screaming at me, you know that Muslims had nothing to do with 9-11, Richie. Yes, I do. Or at least I believe very passionately that Muslims had nothing to do with 9-11. Of course. But what? Has that got to do with having a sense of humour? The programming is very strong with people and the propaganda is very strong. I would imagine that people and most people, by the way, get their news, not from me or people like me, but they get their news from mainstream sources. So if you are on a plane and you learn, having heard everything we've heard about jihad and radical Islam over the last 20 years, most people hearing that the pilot was undergoing a conversion to Islam mid-air might just shit their trousers just a little bit. Might make just a little bit of wee-wee. Imagine it. You overhear the flight attendant saying, Jimmy's um, (laughs) to kill the time he's converting to Islam. I think there might just be a stampede towards the cockpit. My joke, by the way, was more of a commentary on the way things are as opposed to having a go at Islam, which I wasn't doing, all right? Not that I should have to explain it anyway. Grow up and develop a sense of humour. Triggered some folks, 
Anyway, are you ready to groan? Are you ready to groan for a good reason? Brexit. <laughs> Brexit. You love it. You love it, you. You love it, you. You pretend you don't, but I know you love it. Let's look at the front pages of the newspapers. By the way, it's five past eleven. We are live. Had a little worry. About 20 minutes to 11, for some reason, the stream wouldn't connect. Had a bit of a panic attack because I thought, they won't believe me. (laughs) If it doesn't come online, they won't believe me. They'll say it's a Sunday morning. You old baldy Irish bastard. You had a few beers, didn't you? Didn't you, Richie? Is what you would have said. But I rebooted everything and the stream, well, it's working now. Thank heavens for that. Let's look at the Sunday Telegraph, shall we? The front page is plot to oust May near tipping point as MPs' rebellion grows. Plot to oust May near tipping point as MPs' rebellion grows. Well, we're not sure about this. Anyway, The Telegraph writes that the campaign to unseat Theresa May neared tipping point last night as the Conservatives' former London mayoral candidate called on her to resign and a former Brexit minister told how members of the government were hoodwinked over her deal. Now Zach Goldsmith, Brexiteer, failed mayoral candidate, failed, lost out of course to what's his face? What's his face? The mayor of London? Sadiq Khan, that's right. Had to think there for a minute on my feet. Anyway, Goldsmith said he would have voted remain rather than choose Mrs May's plan and that if she leaves, it will give us all the chance of a fresh start. The newspaper, the Sunday Telegraph, was also told that Sir Bill Cash, veteran Eurosceptic, had also submitted a formal declaration of no confidence in May. Bill Cash declined to comment, saying that the process was confidential. Well, obviously not, Bill. Somebody who knows you has obviously been spilling the beans, old chap, because the Sunday Telegraph is well aware that you have drafted a letter. The additional two MPs would bring to 25 the total known to have requested a vote on May's leadership out of a total of 48 required. And they talk about Suella Braverman and Dominic Raab, and we'll hear more about Raab in a minute, other Tories submitting letters of no confidence in Theresa May. Right, now May herself, the Prime Minister, was on Sophie Ridge on Sky News a short time ago and is May being briefed on a potential no-confidence vote? Does she know what's happening? This weekend your future is hanging by a thread. Uh, Conservative MPs, we know, submitting letters of uh, no confidence to the chair of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. If that reaches 48, there will be a vote of no confidence in your leadership. When was the last time that you spoke to Sir Graham Brady? Oh, I spoke to Sir Graham Brady at the end of last week. So do you know if he's have, reached I the have, 48 letters? I have regular conversations with Sir Graham Brady. But let me just... Let Has me he just, reached the 48 well, letters? Let me just... just as <laughs> Graham Brady will make it known... If 48 letters are reached, Graham Brady will make that uh, known. Do you but know? Let me just, you know? But just uh, come on. Answer I the have question. Not, as far as I know, no. The answer to your question is no. Um, but can but I just address been, this? Sorry, just to, so the, the answer to the question is that the 48 uh, limit has not been reached. As far as I know, no, it has not. But let me just address this issue uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the question of leadership. As I say to me, this isn't about me. It's actually about what's right for the country. And as far as I'm concerned, we're not going to be distracted from actually the important job in this critical week of negotiations of making sure we do get that final good deal for the country. Yeah. If I was describing to somebody what Theresa May looks like when she's flapping, somebody who'd never seen her, she looks like Fred Gwynn from the Monsters. Do you remember Fred Gwynn from the Monsters? Her lips and her mouth move about five times up and down before any words come out. It's hilarious. It's actually quite funny. I was giggling away watching it this morning. Or maybe it's just me and my warped sense of humour. But she's a bit like Fred Gwynn, you know. And then something comes out then. And then something comes out. Theresa May. So she thinks that the 48 letters haven't yet been posted or reached. There you go. We'll hear more from Theresa May in a few minutes. She did say, by the way, she's off to Brussels this week to meet Jan, Jean-Claude Juncker, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The Sunday Express, the front page, uh, Tory rebels make their move. Like I said, it's heavily Brexit-centric today. 
The Sunday Express claims that former cabinet ministers Boris Johnson and David Davis have actually had talks to decide which one of them would stand to replace the Prime Minister if the vote of no confidence A goes ahead and B succeeds. Where the Sunday Express is getting their information from is anybody's guess. Their chief political writer, Cam- uh, Cam- it's Camilla Tomini, isn't it? My mind has gone mad this morning. It really is, honestly. Forgetting things. Maybe it's the early onset of, don't say it, Richie. But yeah, um, I think it's Camilla Tomini. Pretty good, but I'm not sure there's any truth in this. But they're saying that Davis and Boris have probably had a pizza and they're arguing over who will stand in the event that May is ousted. The Sunday Times front page headline today is Stand Up to Brussels Bullies. Dominic Raab today has said in the Sunday Times, writing in the Sunday Times, that Theresa May has allowed Britain to be blackmailed and bullied by Brussels and that she should toughen her stance on Brexit or she will face disaster. So, in the Times, the former Brexit secretary, remember he resigned last week, called on Theresa May to show greater political will and he made a veiled pitch for her job, saying Britain would not look like it is, frightened of its own shadow, if he was running the negotiations. But for a time, he was running the negotiations. Is this confusing you, dear listener? Isn't this a bit of bullshit, really? A little bit of bollocks? A bit of monumental bollocks this morning? Here you have a guy who was leading the negotiations after David Davis resigned, saying, if I was leading the negotiations, we wouldn't be frightened of our own shadow. But you kind of played a big part in getting us to where we are now, Dominic. You crazy mad bastard. It's what I would say if I was conducting the interview. Anyway, Dominic Grab called on Theresa May to walk away from the talks rather than submit to the predatory behaviour of dark forces in Brussels. Those words are direct quotations, by the way. Rab said predatory behaviour, and he said dark forces in Brussels. If only he knew. Maybe he does know. Here's BBC political correspondent Peter Saul on the comments made by Dominic Rab today. Yeah, well, Dominic Rab insists that he is still behind the Prime Minister, but a thinly veiled criticism from the former Brexit Secretary in today's Sunday Times, suggesting that the Prime Minister didn't do nearly enough to stand up to what he calls the uh, Brussels bullies, and if we can't get anything better than the current deal, then he says that we should be prepared to leave the European Union without any deal uh, whatsoever. I mean, his principal concern appears to be with this backstop, the insurance policy to uh, ensure that there's no return to a hard border of between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. You're sick of the backstop, aren't you? Be honest. You can tell me. You can tell Uncle Richie. I don't mind. If you hear the word backstop again, you're going to take a high-powered rifle, climb a tower, and start opening up on innocent bystanders, aren't you? Aren't you? My, my plans are already in place. I'm heading to the nearest point in Manchester later on with my rifle. You're sick of backstop, fair enough. The draft deal uh, says that that decision to exit that backstop eventually would be a joint one between the European Union and the UK. He says that that should be Britain's decision uh, to make uh, first and foremost. But as you already have said, Theresa May making it clear that this is the only plausible deal uh, on the table. Just a matter of days after uh, losing her Brexit secretary, he's already proving to be a bit of a thorn in her side. A bit of a thorn in her side, says Peter Saul on the BBC. I can't play you any audio from Rob himself, who was on the Andrew Marr show today, but his interview took place about 15 minutes before I came on air, so I had no time to record it. Presumably, Rab said exactly what he said in the Sunday Times, which you've just heard. And presumably, presumably, Andrew Marr put the point to Rab that I would have put to him. What were you doing, Dominic? Scratching your hairy arse all the time that you were Brexit secretary? You're a tough guy now, talking tough now that you're no longer the Brexit secretary. That's what I would have, would have hoped that Andrew Marr would have said to Dominic Raab. Now, listen up. This is interesting because also on the front page of the Sunday Times this morning is this front page of the Sunday Times, this headline. Operation No Deal hyphen Army Plans for Troops on Street. Operation No Deal hyphen Army 
plans for troops on the street. Wow. Wow. According to the Sunday Times, this isn't new, new, but the Sunday Times are saying it has advanced. It has been suggested in recent weeks that if there were riots because people couldn't get their insulin, if there was riots because people couldn't get their fucking Cocoa Pops or their Rice Krispies over fucking leaving the European Union, if there was riots, the army would come in. So that's been suggested. Now it seems there's a plan. Fucking Rice Krispies. According to the Sunday Times, a team of army planners has started drawing up emergency measures for deploying troops to respond to any chaos caused by the UK crashing out of the EU without a deal. Wow. 20 officers who normally oversee Operation Temperer, which is the plan to provide soldiers to help police after acts of terrorism, those officers were ordered last week to step up no-deal Brexit planning. And that's according to a well-placed army source who has told the Sunday Times this. They are focusing on how the military could help the police keep public order and on how medicines would be delivered to hospitals. The army. Helping to keep public order, eh? Wouldn't that be lovely? Seeing the army on the streets, just like Paris, where it's taken for granted there now that the army are just on the streets, you know. And the way it's going... Dear listener, coming soon to a city near you for your protection, the army. Wonderful. Every dystopian science fiction film you ever saw in your life is coming true now. This is the lunacy. There's no... The thing about this is there's no opposition to this. It's proposed and... Oh, that's a good idea that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the event there's no deal and people can't get their fucking Rice Krispies and people can't get their insulin, send the army out there to make sure that we all don't start killing one another. Crazy. Crazy stuff. 17 minutes past the hour. The Sunday Observer. Like the sister paper, The Guardian, The Observer is overwhelming in its support of Remain. Fair enough, you could argue The Telegraph is a pretty biased Brexit paper, Brexiteer paper. You could argue. So the headline in the Sunday Observer, on the Sunday Observer front page, is Brussels tells May more delay to Brexit will cost UK £10 billion. So this is an alleged warning from the European Union that there won't be any longer transition period. There'll be no delay to Brexit because if there is, it will cost £10 billion extra meaning they'll tack £10 billion onto the so-called divorce bill. That smells of bollocks, that. You know, again, the Sunday Observer just making it up. I, I don't believe they even cite a credible source from Brussels to say that they would tack on an extra £10 billion. It's all fear and scaremongering from the remaining supporting papers today. Anyway, so a little bit more from Theresa May then. As we approach uh, 19 minutes past 11, she was on Sophie Ridge, we heard a little bit earlier on. Corbyn was on too, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. And we will hear from him in a few minutes. Now, Dominic Raab, again, I couldn't bring you the audio from Raab, because Raab, his interview was too close to the beginning of this programme for me to record and edit it. A genius I might be. I'm not. But I'm not that quick, so I couldn't do that. We heard already what Raab said that if he was leading negotiations, he would face down the tyrannical European Union. We wouldn't be bullied. He would give it to them. Now, he's basically said that he resigned, and the final straw for him was hearing news that the European Union intended the backstop customs arrangement to form the basis of the UK's eventual economic relationship with the European Union. See, this backstop thing was an idea... Negoci- negotiated to prevent the need for a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. This is a made-up problem. It never existed. But they made it up and said that if the UK leaves the European Union, it'll cause a problem on the border, which has been friction-free for years since the Good Friday Agreement. It's all a load of lies anyway, right? Ultimately, the deal they agreed on 
was that the UK and Northern Ireland, well, the UK, Northern Ireland is part of the UK, would basically stay in a temporary customs union to avoid the hard border. Problem is with this is, in order for the UK to leave this temporary arrangement in the future, it would need the EU to go along with that. The the UK couldn't unilaterally decide to just piss off out of that arrangement. This is a problem, right? Dominic Rabb is saying that May should go back to the negotiating table and demand that the UK is given a mechanism for unilaterally withdrawing from the backstop. Dominic Rabb pissed off because under the current deal, both sides must agree, which I've just said, which would give Brussels, does give Brussels a veto where Brussels can keep the UK effectively in the European Union indefinitely. Sophie Ridge got into this with Theresa May today. Have a listen to this. Uh, So the withdrawal agreement says the backstop can only be brought to an end if the Union and the United Kingdom decide jointly that it is no longer necessary to achieve its objectives. I mean, this is what Dominic Raab was concerned about, isn't it? This idea that we can't unilaterally decide to leave the backstop. It's a bit like the Hotel California. No, you, you can never leave. No, you, you can leave. And, but and only this is you but, say yes, it's but, okay. Well, first of all, let's let's look at what this backstop is. The backstop's an insurance policy. The backstop is saying to the people of Northern Ireland But it might and happen. Ireland, no, I know but, you don't want it to happen, but it might happen. But look, if I can just explain, because there's different the various stages in this. There's an assumption that somehow this is the only option on the table, and it's not. And that's the first thing that's important to uh, for me to say to you. Now this is an insurance policy. It says that uh, if we get a, come to a point in time where the future relationship that we're ne- negotiating can't be fully in place by the end of December 2020, and we fully intend to ensure it can be, and that's what we're working to, but if there's a short period of time when we need this insurance policy, we need to make sure that people of Northern Ireland still have the reassurance of no hard border between them and Ireland. So. We've got two options at that stage, and we can choose whether to have this backstop, as it, you know, the phrase has come into normal common parlance, or whether to extend the implementation period for a brief period of time. I understand that you don't want once the backstop to happen. Once you're in the backstop, the, 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 if it ever happens... The issue is about being able to leave unilaterally. I mean, yeah. we can leave the EU unilaterally by triggering Article 50. It's about sovereignty. Well, I think as you've just seen... From two years of negotiations on the withdrawal agreement for us leaving the European Union, that yes, there was an article there to leave the European Union, but it's about a negotiation between both sides as to how that is going to be done. That's what we've been entering into. So in the backstop, there will be a review of the backstop and both sides can say, yes, we agree that there are arrangements in place that that deal, that provide for the people of Northern Ireland, uh, and therefore that the backstop is no longer necessary if we're in it. can we unilaterally leave the the backstop? Yes or no? We can't, can we? But, Sophie... Uh, uh, Sophie, uh, I mean, if you you see... uh, Just listen, uh, hang on. Mm -hmm. It's a load of old bollocks. And of course, she can't give a straight answer to a straight question. The answer is no, Sophie. Sophie, what I've done... You see, they're all in on it together, the media and politicians. What would happen there is, May flaps around like Fred Gwynn, Herman Munster, right? Then Sophie Ridge ends the interview. Then there's an ad break while they bring in the next guest and they just laugh about it. And May says, you know, Sophie, I, I obviously can't answer that question because I've basically signed or I want to sign the UK into an agreement with the European Union, which will go on forever and ever and ever, which will mean that we never leave. You know that, Sophie, as well as I do. Let's play the game, love. That's the way it goes, you know. And of course, no matter what, May can't get this passed anyway, right? She can't get it through Parliament. Sophie Ridge again. Well, look, when it comes to Parliament, members of Parliament will have to look at the deal. But I think, as I've previously said, I think they should also think what this is about. This is about delivering on Brexit. It's about ensuring that we deliver what people in this country voted for. I know you think it's a good deal, but it's not going to get through Parliament right now. When people come to look at this deal, that's what they need to think about. But let's look at some of the positions that you've said other parties have taken. In Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn is clear. He's going to vote, vote against this, whatever. He hasn't even fully read it. He doesn't even know what's fully what's in it. And yet already he's saying he's going to vote against it. Why? Because he's playing party politics with this. 
This isn't about party politics. This is about what matters for this country. It's about what is in the national interest. That's what I'm determined to deliver, a deal that's good for the people of this country. Mm. Nonsense. Right, we've heard from May. Jeremy Corbyn was also on the same programme. In fact, he appeared shortly before Theresa May did. Have a listen, this is important. Corbyn on Sophie Ridge. Can you support the deal, Jeremy Corbyn? I think we know the answer. No, we can't support it. It doesn't meet our tests. We don't believe it meets the needs of the country. We do think it would be much better if the Labour alternative of uh, access to a market, a guaranteed permanent form of customs union with the European Union and protection of rights in this country would be uh, a better deal for this country as a whole. So what specifically is it in the text that doesn't meet those tests that you disagree with? Well, a number of things that uh, are in this agreement that are simply not acceptable. One is that the issue of Northern Ireland is not dealt with because uh, it will mean that there will be a border down the Irish Sea unless an agreement is reached within but two years. But how do you plan to solve that yourself? Well, you have an agreement with the European Union for a customs union for the whole of the UK. That has to be that the basis the for it. That is backstop, though, isn't it? Well, but we have no say in that until such time as a backstop has been agreed. And during that period, the EU calls all the shots and the EU decides whether we're allowed to change that arrangement or not. It's a one-way agreement. It's mm. quite risky. Dead in the water, basically. There's no support for this in Parliament. It's not going to pass. Ridge then asked Corbyn, can it be stopped? Now, Corbyn told a German newspaper a week or so ago, two weeks ago, it can't be stopped. Brexit cannot be stopped. Keir Starmer, his um, colleague in the Labour Party, the shadow Brexit secretary, clearly said to Sky News last week that it can be stopped. Who's right, Corbyn or Keir Starmer? Um, Mr Corbyn, can Brexit be stopped? Uh, uh, as of this, this moment, the... Um Arithmetic in Parliament is such that uh, Brexit has been triggered, Article 50. We voted for Article 50, 50 to, um, in order to give respect to the referendum. And I was asked this question by De Spiegel. What I said was, we couldn't stop it because we don't have the votes in Parliament to do so. What I want to do is say to the government, you've had all this time to negotiate. You're not going to get this thing through Parliament. Don't waste another two weeks on this. Go back now, because you must have read the runes in Parliament. You can't get it through. I just want to go back to this point and get some real clarity on it. We can have a look um, at what you uh, said in the interview that you mentioned. When you asked about Brexit, you said, we can't stop it. Um, your Brexit secretary then said, Brexit can be stopped. So who's well, right? Because I'm a bit confused. Well, I said, we can't stop it, because on our own, obviously, we can't. Keir said, Brexit can be stopped, clearly a vast majority of people could if they all agreed to do so. But the point I'm making so you is... You say that you can't stop Brexit. On our own. Time, if Labour swung behind wait, 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 the campaign for a people's vote, there would be... Well, the, people, a the people's vote is a second question, isn't it? Actually. The, the issue is, there was a referendum in 2016. A majority voted to leave the EU. There are many reasons why people voted. I don't think you call a referendum and then say you don't like the result, you go away from it. You've got to understand why people voted and try and negotiate the best deal you can. I do not believe this government has negotiated the best deal it can. Mm. Bit of an unanswer there then, can it be stopped? Bit of an unanswer. What about the idea or the notion of a second referendum? I think Corbyn has flip-flopped on his position here on whether there should be, would be or will be a second referendum. Do you think there should be a second referendum? What, what do you think? I think it's an option for the future, but it's not an option for <laughs> today. Because if we put a referendum tomorrow, what's it going to be on? What's the question going to what be? What would you like the question to be on? Would you like Remain to be on the ballot paper? I think that the tests against the government uh, have to be put now, and that's what we're doing. The government must go back and renegotiate and see what it comes back with, and Parliament must look at that at that time. I think to do anything else now would be to ignore the reality of the situation is that this government's had all this time to negotiate and hasn't really achieved anything. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn supporters, maybe turn down your device now or maybe just don't listen anymore because you're not going to like this. Sophie Ridge asks Corbyn about his history and his anti-European Union stance in days of yore. And I labelled this clip Ridge Nails Corbyn. 
because she properly nails them. Uh, now, I'm interested in your own personal journey when it comes to the EU. Mm. You know, you voted to leave the European Economic Community in the 1975 yes. referendum. You opposed the creation of the European Union in the Maastricht t Treaty. You voted against... No, I, what I, I opposed the Maastricht Treaty because it was bringing in an unaccountable central bank. An unaccountable central bank? Ridge said to him, you opposed the Maastricht Treaty because it effectively created the European Union. Yes, Ms. Corbyn, I did at the time because it was creating a central bank. What's changed, oh bearded one? What's changed about the machinations? What's changed about the structure of the European Union now? Anyway, listen to Corbyn try and talk his way out of this one. And it was moving in the direction of a free market yes. Europe. But so it was moving in the direction of a free market in Europe, yeah. Yeah. Did it stop, Jeremy? So you opposed by by parallel, I strongly supported the social measures that were brought in by the European Union, which Mrs Thatcher so strongly opposed. So well, all this old bollocks know about social measures. So I do support a social Europe. And actually, I've probably spent more time meeting European socialist parties than any other Labour leader ever has. But it's fair to say that you've had your concerns yeah. over the years about of course. Uh, of the course. EU. Yes, yes, of course. I love when people are caught by the short and curlies. How their voice accelerates through the octave. Yes, I, I did, I did. EU and about the uh, European community. I've had so, concerns so have about you, the... Have, 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 I'm interested in your journey. Have, have you changed your mind? Would you consider yourself to be a Eurosceptic? Where, where, where are you at? I've always been in favour of social cooperation across Europe. I've always been in favour of better workers' rights. I strongly supported the whole social chapter agenda that was brought in in the European Union. What I opposed was the development of free market economics in Europe. What I opposed was the state aid rules which limit to differing extents the ability of a government to intervene on its own economy like we would want to to protect the steel industry. But you can't do that, you bearded fucking moron! You can't do that if you are a member of the European Economic Area, even, and, 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 and that, some of them think that's half out. If you are a member of the single market, the customs union, you cannot protect the industries in your own country. The European Union is very specific. You can't fucking do it. You also can't nationalise the railways, the uh, public transport. You can't renationalise the Royal Mail. You can't do any of that as a member of the European Union. You moron, Corbyn. See, Corbyn is even worse than May. As vile a creature as Theresa May is. As criminal a woman as she is. And her husband, by the way. Talked about this. HSBC. May making decisions that benefited her husband's £1 trillion investment fund, both as Home Secretary and as Prime Minister. They are vile, but Corbyn is worse because he knows what the European Union is. He fucking knows. He knows what it's there to do. And nothing can stop it. Nothing. There's no such thing as being a member and amending it from within. Oh, I want to reform from the inside. You can't do it. You can't do it. And this puppet... Fucking faux socialist, pro pretender Corbyn sitting there lying when he only a couple of minutes ago mentioned the central bank. Oh, we had we were that that close to the truth just for a second there about why nobody in their right mind should want to be a member of a fascist super state like the European Union. What a liar Corbyn is! Industry and also have concerns about some of the competition rules, particularly in relation to things like postal services and rail services. So, uh, postal services and rail services. As a member of the European Union, you cannot renationalise those things. Simple as that. Full stop. And Sophie Ridge, God love her, presentable, articulate. She can speak. She can do a piece to camera as good as anybody else. But she doesn't know anything. Because she would nail him on this very point. You cannot have all these Christmas presents that you promised the country if you become Prime Minister, if you're inside the European Union, Jeremy. Describe yourself as a Eurosceptic. I would describe myself as a socialist who wants to see social justice in this country. If he's a socialist, I'm Ronald fucking MacDonald. He's as far from a socialist as you could ever possibly hope to get. Jeremy Corbyn. 
country and across Europe. And I will be in Lisbon at the beginning of December with fellow socialist parties making exactly that message and exactly that case. We have to Yeah, he'll be in Lisbon with socialist parties, probably fighting for transgender rights, probably. That's really important. What a bullshitter. Let me tell you something about Jeremy Corbyn. When he became leader of the Labour Party, dozens of articles were removed from his website. Did you know that? Anti-European Union articles, some written by him, others written by friends of his. Removed! They sanitised this fucker's website after he became leader of the Labour Party. Think about that. He's a pro pretender, a phony fraud, a, a socialist in name only. No real socialist could ever make a case for the European Union. None. How could you protect workers' rights, my arse? The European Union has destroyed workers' rights. It's destroyed the livelihoods of the poorest people right across the south of the continent. And that's what it was meant to do. Christ, it's so obvious. Shouldn't be arguing this stuff. Ah, There was a light moment, though. Thank God there was a light moment. In Corbyn's chat with Ridge, there was a light moment, and it was about whether or not anybody had read the 585-page agreement, the withdrawal agreement between the UK and the EU. Has anybody even read this? The level playing field commitments are in that withdrawal agreement. Have you read the 500 pages? I've read a lot of it, not every last word. I've read many summaries and many other analyses, as I'm sure you have as well. Pages. I've read a lot of it, not every last word. I've read many summaries and many other analyses, as I'm sure you have as well. I've read a lot of it, not every last word. I've read many summaries and many other analyses, as I'm sure you have as well. Um, yeah, um, so... <laughs> Sophie Ridge, mm, yeah, you haven't read it then. What kind of fuckery is this? Ah, Jeremy Corbyn, the gift that keeps on giving, huh? Liars, every single one of them, liars. Do you know what we're going to do now? Well, we all relax and calm down, going to have some music. It's 23 minutes to the top of the hour, a little bit of music. When we come back, we'll go a different way. A couple of other stories that caught our, my eye even, not our eye, that caught my eye today, all right? That's what we'll do on Sunday View. With me, Richie Allen, on Europe's most listened to independent radio show, The Richie Allen Show. Live right now on Fab Radio 2, tune in radio, triggerwarning.tv and richieallen.co.uk for Sunday. On there. Ronald McDonald. 22 and a half to the top of the air. Back with more in a minute. Keep the tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Right, I don't have time to play all of that because there's plenty more to talk about and I want to read some tweets as well. Good morning to Gail. Good morning to Wake Up on Twitter who says, Richie, it is the deep state civil service running this Brexit show. Thanks, mate. Paul tweets, whenever I hear backstop, I think of baseball and pray that they're all caught out. Cheers, Paul. Thanks for that. Good morning to Kelly who's listening live in Paisley in Scotland on Fab Radio 2. Good morning, Kelly. Lovely to hear from you today. Thanks for listening and thanks for checking in with us. Andrew says, I didn't realise how sick I was of the backstop until you put it that way, Richie. What way did I put it? Oh, yeah. Running for the nearest high tower with a loaded rifle to open up on innocent bystanders. I've probably triggered people now who um, uh, are very nervous about about mass shootings. Hi to Zach, who's listening in Cairns in Australia. Good morning, Zach. Have I said that right? Is it Cairns or Cairns? It's Cairns, isn't it, in Australia? Brexit is worldwide, wide even, Richie. Uh, I hope people do wake up to that, says Zach. Good. Not so much abuse this morning then for talking about Brexit again. Let's, let's go down, let's go down. On the army possibly taking over, or not taking over, but assisting the police in the event there are civil disturbances if there was no deal. Rich tweets, Mr Mortimer tweets, who is going to riot? For feck's sake, is a 100-foot wall going to be erected around the country? We could airdrop Cocoa Pops, I suppose, he says. Yes. It's all I care about, Rich. It's the Cocoa Pops. It's all I care about. Ricky tweets, good morning, Ricky. I remember when KFC closed due to the change of distributor and people rang the police. That's right. The police had a phone call. 999 was called by somebody because they couldn't get some KFC. There's a video on YouTube of a woman at a KFC drive-in or drive-through in America, isn't there? 
and she's arguing over over chicken nuggets, I think, and actually calls the police while she's standing at the window of a KFC thing to presumably resolve the dispute that she's having. Good morning to Patrick who tweets, the trouble with politicians and civil servants negotiating something as important as Brexit is that they can't speak or don't speak or they don't even know their minds. They can't negotiate and they haven't got any bottle, uh, says Patrick. Cheers for that, Patrick. Uh, Good morning to David who tweets, wouldn't it be ironic that the protagonists in two wars would be the first to have an occupying army in wave three of consolidated Europe? Referring to uh, France, I think, there, David, to Paris. Uh, absolutely. Uh, good morning to Cartoon Drunk, to David there, uh, to Neil Gardner. There are two politicians I can only watch with subtitles, Richie. And the sound off, he says, Tony Blyer and uh, Theresa May there. Yeah, you're not alone there, I wouldn't have imagined, mate. Feathers Arrows tweets, I love it when people are caught out and their voices go high. Sounds like he got his bollocks trapped in something Jeremy Corbyn there as Sophie Ridge pointed out that he had voted against Maastricht and had effectively voted against the setting up of the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn also, back in 2007 and 2008, was a very vocal critic of the Lisbon Treaty because the Lisbon Treaty set up the European Council and gave us the first European president. But of course, we have to forget all about that now that Jeremy is a hair's breadth away from power. Good morning to Daniel Ford. Good morning, Daniel. Uh, Good morning to uh, Jason. Uh, Good morning, Jason. Uh, Right, I'm going to move on quickly. Right, good morning to Liz Jones as well. Right, let's move on. The Mail on Sunday's front page, we're still on the front pages. It's completely different. It's not anything to do with Brexit at all. It's a story about changing gender. It's a very interesting story. Because the Mail on Sunday has heard from a teacher who remains anonymous for now, but the Mail on Sunday has called her a whistleblower. The headline on the front page of the Mail on Sunday is School with 17 Children Changing Gender. An astonishing 17 pupils at a single British school are in the process of changing gender, according to the Mail on Sunday. Most of the youngsters undergoing the transformation are autistic according to a teacher there, who said vulnerable children with mental health problems were being tricked into believing they are the wrong sex. The whistleblower says few of the transgender children are suffering from gender dysphoria, she says, the medical term for someone who feels they were born in the wrong body. But she says even though they don't have gender dysphoria, they are just as easily influenced, latching on to the mistaken belief they are the wrong sex as a way of coping with problems caused by autism. Earlier this year, the Mail on Sunday revealed that a third of youngsters referred to the NHS's only gender identity clinic for children showed moderate to severe autistic traits. Now, we covered this. The Mail on Sunday revealed earlier in the year that a third of youngsters who were referred to the only gender identity clinic on the NHS actually showed moderate to severe autistic traits, meaning that 150 autistic teenagers were given puberty blocker drugs which stop the body maturing. The teacher says she felt compelled to speak out to protect pupils, many of whom she believes could already be on the powerful puberty blocking drugs, and these children may go on to have life-changing surgery. She believes schools and some politicians have swallowed hook, line and sinker, a politically correct fallacy peddled by a powerful transgender lobby. This is a massive story, this, and it'll get lost today because of all the Brexit stuff in the rest of the press. Now, Mo Mo Lovett is a woman, she's a writer and researcher, and sometimes appears on Sky News to read or review the Sunday newspapers. So this is Mo Lovett. She's a writer and researcher talking about this particular story. This is very interesting. I thought this was such an important issue because it has a lot of 
There's a lot of parents worried about this I I issue because they're getting conflicting uh, messages on, on what, what, what transgender is about and why there's this kind of sudden increase. I mean, uh, earlier this year, uh, the NHS reported a dramatic rise in children um, wanting to kind of transition in, from being a boy to a girl and vice, or vice versa. Um, and this, we have a whistleblower teacher. She's wanted to remain anonymous because this is such a difficult issue. Um, but in her school alone, she says that there are 17 young people. Um, so they haven't gone through puberty, but they'd like to uh, trans, trans, uh, change uh, gender. And with that comes the idea that if you if you have a child who hasn't gone through puberty yet you might start issuing puberty blockers um, and uh, that saves on surgery later on and um, this is such a terrible I issue because this is young children's lives that were kind of taking decisions on before they're even nine or ten years old yeah. um, and, and quite worrying that that, that potentially um younger children are being encouraged by others but, to, but to by question all, their all their mm. Yeah, and there's a lot of this kind of rise of um, uh, transgender YouTube stars, so it's very cool at the moment. I mean, any sociologist will tell you, when you get a sudden trend in something, that there's reasons behind it, and we need to look, we need to look mm. at the research behind why. Um, and the problem is, because it's such a politically um, sensitive issue, because there's a lot of transgender activism that gets very cross at any kind of discussion around this, is research has been pulled. Um, it's kind of, you know, research has already been published, has been made secret. Um, doctors are being kind of encouraged not to discuss all the pros and cons with parents and for fear of saying the wrong thing and then becoming sued. And there's a real shroud of kind of, you can't say that about this issue, uh, which is terrible mm. because this no, is No, as lives. you say, very, very worrying for um, parents and also children concerned. Yeah, that was Gillian Joseph at the end there, the presenter. Mo Lovett was the woman speaking and she was very... I, I would have thought very balanced there, Mo Lovett. It is absolutely reprehensible. The trans radical activists are shutting down and having peer reviewed research papers removed from the view of the public because they say that any question or anybody questioning this whole area of um, gender dysphoria. Anybody asking questions, anybody saying that, you know, it might be a mental health issue, well, they must be bigoted, they must be transphobic, they must be hate speech enthusiasts, they must be shut down. It's crazy. It really is. And it's having a hugely negative impact on some children. She said there that you have the rise of um, trans as a popular trend on YouTube. She said there that you have scenarios where young children are actually kind of indoctrinating other young children into the whole idea that you might be in the wrong body. And then you have the spectre of the research that shows that many of these children are actually on the autistic spectrum. What does that mean? I know that's a big red flag for this program and for our listeners because we've got grave concerns about autism and about what it is and about how children develop it. And I'm obviously wide open to the idea that heavy metal um, exposure, maybe through vaccines, maybe through other w ways and means, are, are contributing to autism. I'm, I'm totally down with that, for want of a better word. This is a very serious thing. So the Mail on Sunday has done a good thing today. Knowing, obviously, it was going to publish this story, this whistleblower teacher who obviously will remain anonymous, the Daily Mail won't be revealing the person's name. They also contacted Bob Withers, now, Bob Withers is a psychotherapist, and he's written in the Mail on Sunday today. And the headline is very interesting. It's a direct quote from Bob Withers. Listen to this. This is the headline. In 20 years, we'll look back on the rush to change our children's sex as one of the darkest chapters in medicine. This is Bob Withers, psychotherapist. I'm going to read you just a smidgen of this, by the way. This is Bob Withers. Now listen up. He writes, Let me be absolutely clear. I am in no doubt that there are people who feel they are one gender while having the body of the other. Living with such constant internal conflict is horrifying for many of those affected and it should never be ignored. No one should seek to suppress another person's genuinely held sexual orientation or gender identity. But the question we must ask ourselves today is this. 
How do we decide whose needs are genuine and how then should we treat them? I have been a psychotherapist for more than 30 years and in that time I have worked with a small but significant number of patients who wished to change gender. For everyone's sake, I believe that surgery, which is irreversible, should only ever be a last resort. We should always begin by working to help the mind fit better with the body before we start altering the body to fit the mind. Yet, in today's NHS, professionals are enabling hundreds, possibly thousands of teenagers to have major surgery to change their gender. It is being done almost unchallenged in the name of transgender rights. But in 20 years' time, I believe we will look back on this folly as one of the darkest periods in the history of modern medicine. We will question why we failed to challenge their belief that they were born in the wrong bodies. And this is significant. This is a three-decade long professional. This is a very vastly experienced professional who's worked for three decades. And this is a profound statement. It shouldn't be profound, but it is. He says, we will question why we failed to challenge their belief that they were born in the wrong bodies. What's wrong with that? Well, the trans radical fascists, you could call them, are trying to shut anybody down who asks that very question. Why do you believe you are a woman? when you were born a man? Why do you believe you're a man when you were born a woman and so on? He goes on to write, does the psychotherapist, we will ask why we so readily ignored the clanging alarm bells that many were autistic or had mental health problems. What we are faced with today is extremely worrying. While 17 children are transitioning in one secondary school, be in no doubt, it is almost certainly being repeated in other schools. What is happening is this, we are bringing up a generation of children who have quite complex mental health issues. Why? Why, 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 why? Why are so many children dealing with complex mental health issues? Please listen to an interview I did last week with Professor Jean Twenge from San Diego. Smart woman, talking, no pun intended, talking about smart devices and the impact it is having on children, the exposure to these devices. It is making them more defensive, less outward looking, less confident, more prone to problems like the problems he's discussing there. It's all connected, folks. He goes on to write, does the psychotherapist, identifying as trans can feel like a way to explain that suffering, rather than understanding where it might be coming from. So feeling lonely or isolated, being bullied, having an autistic spectrum disorder or struggling with any number of issues from sexuality to abuse to self-harm. We're not dealing with those issues. We are allowing people to change their sex. It's lazy and it's damaging and it's the wrong solution and one which NHS professionals, teachers, politicians and the law are all too eager to embrace to signal their progressive views. Yes, that's absolutely spot on. Rather than admit that you are not comfortable with what is happening, you suppress that feeling of discomfort in order to virtue signal that you are a progressive. It is fucking mental. Again, no pun intended. It's coarse crass way to describe it. It is maddening. Dozens and dozens of children in schools around the country with autism, on the autism spectrum, then declaring through peer pressure and through God knows what else, well, I'm actually in the wrong body. This leads to puberty suppressing drugs and in many cases leads to surgery. Bob Withers writing brilliantly, in the mail on Sunday today. And you know, Twitter, this is no joke, and this is why you say it's connected, it's an agenda. Twitter are cracking down on people who are challenging the notion of gender identity by deleting their Twitter accounts or banning them for a period of time. And there's a woman called Megan Murphy, Megan Murphy, who she's Canadian, but she's got to have Irish lineage, no doubt. 
She edits Canada's leading feminist news magazine. It's called Feminist Current. She was really told by Twitter, recently told by Twitter even, that some of her tweets had violated Twitter's rules on hateful conduct. And in fact, the tweets were fairly benign. The tweets were, men aren't women, one. The second one was, how are trans women not actually men? Twitter got straight in touch and said, any more of that, love, and you'll be off the platform. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. We're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny group of people who've managed to co-opt the media and politicians all over the world to back unreservedly their ridiculous fascist agenda. If we say we are the opposite sex, and that should be fine, by the way, it should be fine for anybody to say, listen, I'm not really a man. I know I look like a man and I sound like one, but I'm a woman. It should be okay. People should do whatever they want, but they want to transform society, you see. And there is no opposition to it in politics. There is no opposition to it in the media, save for the occasional uh, run against it by the Mail or by the Telegraph in the UK. I can't speak for the American media. It's crazy, folks. It really is. And it's one of those that comes up so often because as it develops this, as it rolls out, more and more and more children are being put in harm's way by the virtue signalling head teachers of their schools and teachers who refuse to say, well, hang on a second, you know, why do you think that you're a girl? Or why do you think that you're a boy? Let's have a look at that from an objective perspective. No, no chance. Listen, that was Sunday View. Thanks for listening to it. We're right out of time. I had more stories about Israel and the BDS movement, but they will keep for tomorrow because they are important. I need to keep this for an hour. It makes sense for the repeats for it to be an hour. Long, uh, thanks for listening to me, by the way. Thanks for all your tweets. Going to wind up with a little bit of music, as I always do. Look after yourselves and one another. Enjoy your Sunday. And um, we'll speak again at 5pm UK time tomorrow. Monday for Monday's Richie Allen Show. I've enjoyed this today. Thanks again for your company. Glorious day today right across the UK. Get out and enjoy it, folks. Speak tomorrow. Bye now. Bye now.